With respiratory acidosis, acidosis refers to a process that lowers blood pH below 7.35. And respiratory refers to the fact that it's a failure of the respiratory system carrying out its normal pH balancing job. Now, normally during an inhalation, the diaphragm and chest wall muscles contract to pull open the chest, and that sucks in air like a vacuum cleaner. Then during an exhalation, the muscles relax, allowing the elastin in the lungs to recoil, pulling the lungs back to their normal size and pushing that air out. Ultimately, the lungs need to pull oxygen into the body and get rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide binds to water in the blood, and forms carbonic acid, which then dissociates into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. So in order to prevent pH fluctuations, the carbon dioxide concentration or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, called PCO2, needs to be kept within a fairly narrow range. For this reason, the lungs maintain the ventilation rate they need to get rid of carbon dioxide at the same rate that it's created by the tissues. If PCO2 starts to rise and pH starts to fall, chemoreceptors that are found in the walls of the corroded arteries and in the wall of the aortic arch start to fire more. And that notifies the respiratory centers in the brainstem that they need to increase the respiratory rate and the depth of breathing. As the respiratory rate and the depth of each breath increases, the minute ventilation increases. And that's the volume of air that moves in and out of the lungs in a minute. The increased ventilation helps move more carbon dioxide out of the body, which reduces the PCO2 in the body and raises the pH. In respiratory acidosis, the normal mechanism of ventilation is disturbed, and minute ventilation becomes inadequate to balance the pH. This can be due to a number of problems, sometimes the problems not in the lungs themselves, but in the respiratory centers of the brainstem. After a stroke or a medication overdose, like with opioids or barbiturates, the respiratory centers can slow their rate of firing, so breathing becomes extremely slow or stops entirely. It could also be due to a neuromuscular disorder, like myasthenia gravis, where the nerves don't effectively stimulate the muscles to contract. Sometimes the diaphragm or chest wall muscles don't work properly, which can happen after severe trauma, or due to obesity when the chest wall is too heavy for the muscles to lift it. Another reason is airway obstruction, which might happen if a child swallows an object like a peanut and it lodges in the right mainstem bronchus, preventing the lung from fully ventilating. Finally, there might be impaired gas exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries. That might happen if alveoli are damaged from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or if fluid accumulates within the alveoli like in pneumonia, or if fluid collects between the alveoli and the capillary walls like in pulmonary edema. In all these situations, the result is that the lungs can't efficiently get rid of carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide rises, usually above 45 millimeters of mercury. This causes a decrease in blood pH, often reducing it below 7.35. To compensate for this decrease, the body has designed several mechanisms. If the respiratory centers are working, then they try to increase the rate and depth of ventilation. If that doesn't work, then some of the excess carbon dioxide diffuses across cell membranes, especially into red blood cells, where it reacts with water molecules and forms carbonic acid, which eventually gets converted into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. The key here is that this bicarbonate can quickly escape to the circulation trying to counteract the increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide and keeping the pH from getting too low. At the same time, though, free hydrogen ions are generated, which could very well make the intracellular environment acidic. Fortunately, they can be bound and neutralized by various basic molecules within the cells, mainly exposed NH2 or amine groups in proteins like hemoglobin. The concentration of these proteins, though, is too low compared to the amount of excess carbon dioxide molecules floating through the blood. What this means is that if all of the carbon dioxide molecules tried to hide inside the cells, they'd give rise to a whole lot of hydrogen ions that have no spare protein to bind to, and therefore this would mess with the intracellular pH. So essentially, only a small amount of carbon dioxide molecules find their way into the cells. 
As a result, the amount of bicarbonate that's generated is too little, about one milli equivalent per liter for each 10 millimeters of mercury increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide in order to have a substantial effect on pH. For example, if partial pressure of carbon dioxide has an acute rise of 20 millimeters of mercury, let's say it moved from 40 to 60, then this mechanism could only result in a rise of plasma bicarbonate by 2 milli equivalents per liter, from its reference value of 24 up to 26, which doesn't have a big impact on pH. Therefore, the pH remains very low during this acute phase of the disorder. Fortunately, if minute ventilation hasn't decreased to life-threatening levels, then within about 3 to 5 days, the kidneys start sensing that pH is too low and step up to help correct the imbalance. More specifically, the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule start generating and reabsorbing more bicarbonate into the bloodstream. In fact, the kidneys are pretty effective in doing this, since they manage to increase the concentration of bicarbonate about 4 milliequivalents per liter for each 10 millimeters of mercury increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So if partial pressure of carbon dioxide went up from 20 to 40 millimeters of mercury, which is a 20 millimeter of mercury increase, plasma bicarbonate would increase by 8 milliequivalents per liter, going from its reference value of 24 to 32 milliequivalents per liter. This can lead to a substantial increase in the pH, bringing it closer to its normal range again. All right, as a quick recap, respiratory acidosis happens when the lungs fail to eliminate excess carbon dioxide which builds up in the blood, causing blood pH to fall below 7.35. It's divided into an acute and a chronic phase, according to the absence or presence of renal compensation, respectively, which raises bicarbonate concentration in the blood.